All right, good evening and welcome back. It's been too long. Thank you for joining me and hanging out a little bit tonight in the shop. It's been, and it's been three weeks. Feels like longer than that. So I missed sort of seeing you, <laughs> but I have, uh, I've missed being together here in the shop and I'm glad we can do it again. And tonight I've got a really cool topic. I am working through the design of a new table base for a small uh, end table, a round table, similar to a shaker style. So stick around if you want to be part of that. Remember, always subscribe. If you enjoy this content, you get some value out of it, why not? And also uh, press that red button to get notified. Um, well, it's the red button. It's the I'm bell. Sorry, I the think. bell. Yeah. yeah, there's a bell and there's a button. <laughs> <laughs> so both of those, and you will be covered for a good long time. Yeah, and we'd also love for you to consider in 2021 joining our, our Epic Woodworking mailing list, which you can access in the notes below, the description below. There's a link for that. And uh, right. you get a free gift for joining. And uh, oh. yeah, so stay in touch with us this year. Lots of good stuff happening. Awesome. I didn't know about the free gift. Yeah. Can I get one through? Yes, you can. Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> um, actually, that's where you get the insider information, where we talk about everything that's going on. We can't really do that on YouTube as much. So we are excited. If you've seen some of the early videos from um, Fine Woodworking Magazine, that project, the Shaker Dresser, is ongoing. I'm really excited to get that to the point where you can all see it. Uh, we've shot almost the entire series, but they're leaking it out um, slowly. And then there'll be a, an article in an upcoming Fine Woodworking magazine. I think it's going to be early spring. So that should be fun to finally reveal that. I've had so much fun building that. But let's get to the topic at hand, shall we? Um, you know, when we were getting ready for Christmas, we were kind of scrambling around for gifts at the last minute as, I don't know why, that happens every now and then. Um, somehow we always come through, <laughs> right? Thanks to you, we do. Yeah, right. <laughs> so this year, you know, our kids were visiting. Uh, they're all in their 20s now, so it was kind of interesting coming from uh, different parts of the country, from... LA and Nashville and uh, anyway I thought hey I'll give him some kind of nice wooden object maybe I could come up with something <laughs> so I came out and I looked around maybe a tissue box cover or um, a cutting board what else do we have uh, serving trays coasters mirrors I mean all these things we've done over the last year I've got a lot of in process but um, what we landed on was these. You remember these tops? Uh, I've got a lot of these tops around. We did a, a, a course, well, a Shop Night Live on making this little uh, compass rose inlay detail after I had done a course out with the Rochester Woodworkers Group in New York. We, we made this top with zebra wood and then inlaid it with that uh, compass rose. So I had that, and you know, that was pretty nice, but I've always wondered, what do I do with these things? I mean, they could make Lazy Susans. We made a clock out of one. You could, but I think the best thing would be for a table, to make a table. Now these are just some examples that are unfinished. Um, so I actually gave our kids, um, each one of these finished tops. So here's a finished version of that. Is that glaring on you? No. Okay. Good. So there's the zebra wood finished. And this one, I, I'm going to color the bottom. But that's maybe got possibly one more coat on the top. But um, I built up some coats of Danish oil and then just wiped on a coat of satin water locks. It looks awesome, and I don't have to do much. I may just rub it out with steel wool at the end 
and it'll bring up the sheen a little bit. And then check this out. This is the other version. This is uh, Cuban Mahogany, the Sunburst, the 12-piece match. And I put in a nice little ebony inlaid line, a binding line around, the, around that outer edge. And then that veneer is vertical on the edge, too. So these would make great tabletops. And uh, my oldest son, I was really happy when he said at Christmas, when he opened it up and he said, wow, I must be getting old because I'm kind of excited to get a piece of furniture. <laughs> I said, I don't think I've ever really given them furniture for Christmas. It's no, funny. Not we, this quality. We used to always give it to my sister and brother-in-law at Christmas. And um, he said, I used to always wonder why people got so excited when I, all I wanted was Legos. So anyway. No, none of them do woodworking, uh, Madison's asking. No, that, no they're they in other artistic. artistic creative endeavors. So yes. um, I'm happy that they're doing what they want. Um, it's funny, I don't, didn't really wish this on them. We've done some woodworking out here when they were younger, uh, mostly weapons. <laughs> and uh, Cars. Yeah, and volcanoes. Volcanoes, swords, and well, that's the, in the weapon category. Right? <laughs> <I guess. laughs> but anyway, um, so I want to make a base for these tops. Now, these are really much more in the contemporary category. So, but I wanted to make it based somewhat on this shaker candle stand. So, check that out. This is classic. This is, a, they call it a candle stand because, you know, they didn't have electric lights back then in the 1800s there, in early 1800s. So they would always need a table nearby to set the candle, to read by, to just to get ready for bed, I guess, you know, and, uh, or to sew or whatever was going on. Especially this time of year, we only have nine hours of daylight right here in New Hampshire in uh, early January. Um, but this is a quintessential uh, shaker design. It is just beautiful, streamlined. I've shown this a few other times, but it's a, just a beautiful example of the, the integrity of joinery here. I mean, that's a sliding dovetail right up into the column. And then there's a wedged tenon on the top of this cleat. And even the cleat, you know, will give it some sculptural effect there. And then it gets thin out to the outside. So you barely see it from the top. And the edge gets a nice round under. Now these were made in little different ways at the various villages. But this is a nice example um, of one of, in this style, I think, is where they really hit the home run as far as um, the overall composition of it. So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, you know, if I made a table base like that now, you know, we just stuck a top on like that. I mean, obviously the color may not work, but it feels to me, I was looked at this a lot, that feels like a period base, like an older, you know, traditional shaker base. And on the top, we have a more contemporary thing going on here. So, but I really like that three-legged thing. So I thought, all right, I'm going to design a table. And my initial idea was something that the kids could pack up and bring with them back home at Christmas. Didn't make that deadline. No. <laughs> <laughs> I had enough to do putting the edges in, getting them finished. But I did get a really solid start on the design. I, in fact, I had um, them all put together to some degree, but uh, they still wasn't finished. So um, I was thinking that the design needed to lay relatively flat, and I wanted it to be easy to assemble. So I thought, hey, I'm not going to do a turn column. I'm going to actually have a hexagonal column down the middle into which these legs will attach and that the center column will almost disappear because the legs will just attach into one of the fat three facets. Um, so that was the idea. 
and I made a little scribble sketch of the leg and started thinking about the proportions and all that. So I'm going to set these aside for now and just show you a little bit of the process that I went through and <coughs> and where I'm at with the design and oh are we not coming here sorry no <laughs> I know you really like those tops I do <laughs> I'm over here I like you more though <laughs> all right so anyway I was um I sketched it out and then I transposed the little sketch onto my drawing pad. I don't have my little sketch. I don't know what happened to it. But here's the sketch I made on my drawing pad where, I mean my little drawing board, with kind of the leg. So this, I made this, this height right here. This is the top. It's about five eighths to three quarters inch thick. It could be slightly thinner even. Um, and I set it at 24 inch high overall. So the base will be about 23 and a quarter. So once I had that drawn to scale, then I knew my diameter of the top is right around 17 and three quarters, um, 17 and five eighths right in there. And so I drew a line straight down and then started playing around with the shape. And so um, I just drew that in and got it where I felt like it looked all right, you know, but I didn't, you still don't know. The thing about designing is it's just, it's a developmental kind of process. It just, you add one piece to another. You get to see it at different stages and you keep, you know, stroking your chin and thinking, hmm, do I like that? Is it there yet? And you keep making more and more modifications. So it's like you start with a rough draft, you refine, you refine until you get it to where you really like it. So once I had that scale drawing, I said, you know, that looks pretty good. And then I made all the, I made that little graph. You can see, I meant to say that, sorry, while you were here, um, that little grid. So I could scale how far things were and how I could transpose this onto a full size drawing okay um, nice. this by the way if you haven't seen it there is a video on making this little drawing board I'm really liking it yeah, you know, it's a beauty. the only thing I'm gonna do is put a little stop at the bottom so that'll just hang out there easier and it won't occasionally it'll fall off the bottom because it's so slick it's got that uh, that shellac and wax all right, so here's my, after I transposed it, I just recreated the same grid of lines now, except actual size. I've got my height overall is up here. That's to the bottom. This is the base. And so that's like 23 and a quarter from there to there. So. <clears throat> kind of hard to see. You can't see it? It's a little light. Maybe the bright, light's too bright. All right. Sorry, I should have made this in pen. Okay. It's still in pencil, but here's the leg. <laughs> it's right at my fingertip. And then up here, I was, this worked out later. I didn't think about this, how I was going to do this till later. But I have a nice little miter here. And instead of a cleat, I'm just going to make these little supports that'll be the top supports. And one singular screw will go out there. Now, uh, let me show you, once I got to this point, I then needed to make my template, my, for, um, my template to saw out the leg parts. So let me show you that. Tom, Steve's asking if the legs will be dovetailed in the table post. No, no, I'm gonna get to that in a minute. As I said, what I'm gonna do is the, the table, the post, is this, this is my post, a hexagonal column into which the three legs will meet. So much different. Um, there is no like upper column. The leg is just gonna join right into this. So um, I'll, I'll show you more about that in a second. This is the leg, 
that I developed from this drawing. Now, all of this I'm telling you, it might be included in a full course, a project course, if you guys like this enough. I don't know. Um, that, those round tops we make in our veneering course. So some of you have a round top at home, and you haven't done anything like it. Raise your hand. <laughs> but uh, it's super easy. Or some other round top lying around. Yeah. I mean, you can make these so out of solid. They're not that big, so there's not a lot of movement to be concerned about. But um, yeah, they'd be great for really an exquisite piece of wood or something like that, small enough to do it. So this was my first version. And after I actually mocked it up with some of the pieces, it felt a little heavy in here. So I took off. You can see, see that line, that pencil line? Can you see that? I see. I took off a good eighth of an inch in here. I came out from nothing and then came in and out. So that became the second version, which is this one. It's a little thinner. So I don't even need that one anymore. This is a, a thinner. And this is what I'm saying about refinement, you know. Mm. I may decide later on at some point I want to change it up a little more, but that's going to be it. Now, for the materials, I had uh, already planed down some, some really interesting quarter sawn ash that came from that massive tree that used to be in the back of the shop. If you've been around long enough and you remember those giant tree cookies that I showed you one time with all the growth rings, the 185-year-old ash tree, uh, treasure, finding treasure in your backyard. I think that's what that video was called. Well, that tree yielded the leg material for this project. So, let's see. Oh yeah, I got a piece right here, good. This is one of the last pieces. It's kind of streaky, this piece. Um, you know, ash has like a darker heart to it. So, this just has some streakiness. Maybe it's because the tree um, was on the ground a little bit, but not, it didn't really rot out or anything like that. There are just some dark lines in it. So my thought is that this base will be stained. It's already stained. <laughs> but it, I'm thinking I may even ebonize it and just go black with the shape. So let's move on. I'm skipping over a lot of stuff, but I just want to get to the point where I can show you uh, one or two little processes. So check this out. This is the way it ended up, each leg ended up being. So I was able to just draw these out and then I bandsawed to the line and I cleaned it up actually on, on a, a big, uh, like a three inch diameter sanding drum on my drill press. And then I jointed this edge to make it nice and flat. So this is nicely trued up. The process of making this was a little bit involved, but um, just, again, I cut a 45, a 45 on a piece here, and I also made a little template for this, which I don't have at my fingertips here. It's on the other table. It doesn't matter. It's just the same shape. So I would, out of this template stock, and then I drew it on there and cut it out after I had cut my little domino. So this is, these are dominoes. This is also called a floating tenon or a loose tenon, uh, but they, they give you a lot of strength and they also help you with alignment. So this joint would be, you know, at a 45 mitered, so just glue there alone would not be a lasting structural joint. So by putting this little floating tenon across here and when we glue that in, man, it's gonna be really strong. Now, sometimes when you glue in things like this, it's a bit of a question of how to set up to clamp that. So a lot of times what I'll make are these um, little sticks. You, you could actually, sometimes I've glued a block on there and had the right angle on it. Um, sometimes you can tack a piece on there and, and use it as a clamp, but 
you've got a clamp, you always want to try to get your clamp pressure to be 90 degrees to the glue line or the seam. So I want my clamp to be pulling pressure right across like that, which is kind of tricky when this surface is coming in at a 45 and a 45 to get a clamp to hold. So by cutting these little triangular blocks out of just some other scrap, and then I just glued them on to st stick other scrap from the same project, I'm able to establish some anchors to hold the clamp. So let me just show you how that went. I'm not going to actually glue this up, but this is a little strategy that is helpful. Um, I'm just going to put this here. And I can get it faster. I'm always thinking of ways, how can I make this faster? Like if you were going to make these in some kind of production. So there, now this one's clamped here. And this block, this line is approximately parallel with our glue joint. Then we get our second one on. So if I, I can just take it here actually. And these clamps are a little big for this, but whatever, I'll just go ahead and use it. So I'm just gonna pop this clamp on, set that back a little bit and snug it up. Then you can see when this comes together, those glue blocks are right in line. And all I need to do is bring in, once I get glue on the whole tenon, I would just come in here with a clamp and snug that up. Make sure that's flush. There's a little movement in it. And you get a super nice pressure right on that glue joint as if it was a parallel joint now, just by setting up some kind of um, blocks to help you out. So if I was going to go into production with this, I would think about it, you know, different ways of quickly, you know, just efficiently getting those blocks in position. It could be that they were attached to a table and you wedged it. Uh, there's a lot of clever things you can do to make it work. But then if you're on the table, you got to think about the glue coming out and not uh, gluing the piece to the table. <laughs> so anyway, this is a good initial strategy just to get that pressure on there. And I'll often set up blocks like that on complex type angular glue ups. All right, so I'm going to set this aside. People are liking that little tip. I like the little tip. <laughs> And uh, and now I'm going to show you, here's the stack of legs I got all ready to rock. So these are all done, except for shaping. But this is basically the table. So if I can attach those into a center column, I'll have a pretty interesting looking table. But how do I get those adjoined? to the column. Now, I showed you just a second ago the octagonal column, I mean hexagonal. Now, it took a little bit to figure this out. I just drew it out and I needed facets on each surface about three quarters of an inch wide. So by drawing it out, I realized I needed to make this. I needed to start with a block that was an inch and five sixteenths thick by an inch and a half wide. So it's inch and five sixteenths here, and it's an inch and a half overall in width. And then I just set my saw blade at 30 degrees and made a rip here. And then I flipped it and I made a rip here. I was careful to set the saw so I left myself a little flat there. So I had drawn the center line and I wanted to let that center line stay there. After those two rips, I wanted to see a little flat because then I had to flip and reference that edge, small as it is, off the fence. And then I could make another 30 degree, another 30 degree, and I, was, I had my hexagon. So after that, I went and sent it through the sander a few times to create a nice smooth 
hexagonal piece. And it's pretty darn close to accurate. Now, once I, while I was still set up on the table saw, I ripped me a couple 30 degrees. <laughs> what are you reading? <laughs> the camera lady is multitasking again. I, Pardon me. Sorry. <laughs> that's all right. Um, once I, is, is there something good? Some comment there? Okay. Um, once I had this, the table saw blade at 30 degrees, I went ahead and ripped a couple strips of 30 degrees scraps. <laughs> what is wrong with my mouth? <laughs> and, uh, and look, looky here. I tacked them to the table. So I made a little crib um, or a nice seat that comes in at 30 and 30 so that my hexagon will sit right in there and won't wobble. But it feels really nice and solid. By doing that, I have now have this edge is at 90 degrees to the table. Okay, so I've got a nice point of reference to be 90 degrees to the table. Now, I decided in order to join this in, if we take one of our legs here, I cut these just to the length here, which ends up being right about 10 inches high. That's how much my column is. So no more dovetail. I want to join this in. Now, I could just glue that on and clamp it and run some screws in. I actually thought of that. Like, I mean, you could just put a dowel in there, a small dowel to reference it, um, glue it, and you could set and plug some screws running in here um, or just glue it up, right? Because this grain, if you look at it, it's running up. It is end grain, but it's, it's kind of long end grain. So it's technically what you're creating there is like a, almost the same surface as you get with a scarf joint. If you were to join two boards at an angle, you have the grain running angular to the glue joint, which is not optimal for strength. The optimal strength of a glue joint is when you're gluing right along the side grain like that. The weakest is right end grain to end grain because there's a lot of holes in that surface. But here we've got the grain coming in kind of a hybrid of the two, but it's actually almost long grain. It's way steeper than a 45. That's actually intentional. When this leg is sawn out, it's kind of a funky shape, right? So when you lay it out on your material, you want to try to get that strength of the fibers of the tubes, the long grain, to be running down the axis of your funky shape. So that line is approximately right in through here. So we carry the longest grain, yielding the greatest strength to our curvy leg shape. So that's why I didn't want to go too much thinner than this. If you go too thin here in here, you start to weaken the structure a bit. Um, it could maybe even stand for a little more. I don't know. I'm still thinking about it. We'll all stroke our chins and think about it at the end together. All right. So anyway, this is the top. And I'm going to reference off the top to not put dowels. I'm going to put in some dominoes. So check it out. This is the, if you haven't seen it, this is the domino by Festool. It, um, it basically cuts those floating tenons I showed you earlier on that joint. So we've got more floating tenons. And, you know, this same step could be done with the good old Norm Abrams biscuit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not many of us have festivals, so. No, good exactly. Things. You can do biscuits. Um, like I said, you can run screws. There's a number of ways. I've thought about how to do this, but. This is a really reliable method right here. I'm just going to show you what I'm doing for these tables because rather than ship them flat, like I was thinking, they might take them home flat, we're going to box these up fully glued up and assembled. So there's not, they don't have to assemble them when they get home. I was thinking, you know, hey, I'll, I'll just insert, put some plugs in there. They can screw them together and then they could disassemble. It would be the table would just have less integrity, and it would look like a, you know, what's that, um, 
assembly of furniture company. Kia? Ikea? Ikea, yeah. I was thinking Kia. Yeah. That's the car. The car. <laughs> yeah, an Ikea piece. So anyway, um, it's not that bad to ship these, is it? What did we figure out? To Nashville, was it 30, 40 bucks? Um, yes. Yeah. About 38, I think it was. Yeah, because they're in a box small enough, you know, it's not, it's like 28 by 18 by 18. So anyway, um, so what I want to do now is lay out to put my dominoes in. Now these, I'm going to just use these and I'm going to, I decided I would put three in. Now you can see already that I've got these little hash marks. Can you see those? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Very good, class. So we've got one, two, three. That's how the spacing is going to be. And these have to be very accurately spaced because I want to mark the same separation. I want to get those lines transferred exactly the same, referencing off the top onto my legs so I can get the same joint there. I don't want much play in these side to side. So. Um, the way I mark those out, I thought about it, you know, when you're trying to make something fast, you could make a stick, you know, one this length that would hook on the end, another one that went to here that hooked on the end, and a third one, you could just take them one at a time, or you could, you know, be changing your uh, combination square and making that mark. But it dawned on me that, uh, these new uh, woodpecker squares come in pretty handy because these have all these notches and I've hardly used these, but I thought, man, that would actually work quite nicely. And what I did was I put pieces of tape with little indicator hash marks in the groove that I want to make my reference. So I don't have to make a special stick. I don't have to do any of that. And then all I did was reference off the top, and I had this in the vise, and I made a little tick mark right at those pencil marks, holding the square tight at the top. So, to make sure I'm doing this right. Yeah. So to do the, the base, I need to, I mean the leg, I need to reference off the seam. So if I keep this square off the top, I should end up nice and flush. I'm just going to throw a quick clamp on here. So it doesn't slide around too much. And I'll show you how I did that. It's super easy. You just take, I just got my number five here, five mil. And I'm just going to go, that's about one and three quarters. Then this one's, then the third one right in there. And that's it. It's like really accurate and super easy. I know it'll line up perfectly with the column hash marks. So now let me just show you how I did this. I had to figure out, I want this to plunge right about the middle of my column here. So I had to get that with some uh, riser pieces. I needed, I realized I needed about three eighths of an inch, which I have here and put it in the saddle here and I'm going to just line up my line on the best tool and make my cut. Here we go. So there you have it. We just have our nice three quick slots right there. And then with the, uh, with the leg, of course, I would go around and do all three sides. I don't want to bore you there. Tom, is the centerpiece also one quarter ash or some other wood? No, I'm, I actually have cherry there. Um, I was just looking for something. I had chunky cherry. And I didn't want really ash for the column because if you've ever split wood, 
you know ash splits really well. Um, so I wanted a more dense closed grain wood for the column and it's funny calling that a column but it, it is going to act as a <laughs> column here. So then on the on the leg itself I had I just needed a piece of veneer that I realized I had to put some tape on there to get it up to the right height and I slip it under the leg and I'll hit those super easy. <laughs> I would just take the little dominoes and you see I got it on a setting where there's really no room for play at all. They have this little extra rib on the edges. You never want to sand the face because they're already made to fit beautifully. So you just sand that. If it, they're tight, you just knock that rib off a little bit and they go right in nicely. Let me take another. The old sandpaper glued to the block. <laughs> ben Strano was mentioning how much he likes having one of those too. It just uh, comes in handy for little things like this. Just knocking that rib off. Ben, ben from Fine Woodworking oh, might want to disqualify her. I, didn't ben is. I thought I said that, sorry. People might My not. bad. Oh, I don't think you did. Maybe. Yeah, I didn't. You've, oh, if you've listened to Shop Talk Live, right? That's what they call it. Mm -hmm. um, he's the host of that. Fine woodworking. All right, so this is the one I just cut. Yeah, because I just have one in there. So I'll match the top with the top, and we mark these out off the same jig. So look at that. It goes together like bada. And it's nice and flush at the top. And there it is into the column. And it's strong. I mean, just with that, it doesn't want to move. So I would put a nice clamp on there and there with some glue. And we would have a really solid joint there into this pretty delicate little column. And then this little cleat comes out. And that's got a solid joint there as well to support the table. So there. Now, at this point, we're seeing the actual profile that we drew. But how's it going to look in three dimensions? I'm not really sure yet, but I'm going to show you in a minute. One last thing I want to say is I always like to slightly radius these outside surfaces. It's, it's flat, it's square, and it doesn't have a warmth. So by giving yourself a slight radius to this outside surface, it will not only conform nicely with the rounded edge of the top, you'll have a little bit of curvature down here, right? But it'll also be a much warmer inviting piece. It's hard to explain it, but I will show you. I show you right now. Okay. Tom, does the, uh, do the dominoes from each of the different positions ever meet each other? Oh, yeah, I checked that out. Good question. Yeah, I was thinking about that, like how deep I should go here. Brian's asking that. Question. Yeah, Brian, good question. They don't actually touch, but they come close. They, they get close, and I thought, am I weakening this thing too much to have three shot in there? But I have so much strength in the fibers around it. There's like three columns of fibers, and then you have all the strength around the actual joint that this is technically, it's probably better structurally than the sliding dovetail into the column of the old shaker one. Because if you think about it, a sliding dovetail when it's going up into a column like that, when the table, the main pressure you get is downward. And that dovetail can act as a wedge and want to wedge and split the column. Well, you won't get that here. Um, 
you'll have this long actual scarf glue joint with three tenons in there as well. So this, as small as it is, it's actually, I'm feeling good about the integrity of this table base. Did how's, you consider it look? offsetting the? I did consider it, but I thought, is it necessary? And I decided not to because I don't think there's an issue with the lack of strength. So I didn't, it, if you can simplify the layout, it wasn't really necessary, then it made it easier to construct this if I just go all the same with the three across. <coughs> so <coughs> I'll just show you really quickly what I do over here. <coughs> I have on my router table, I've got a 5 eighths roundover bit but it's only set up so that the bottom edge of that bearing is about the center line of my piece. So I'm really taking very little, but I'm getting enough of a round over that I'll go one direction and then I'll flip it and go the other. I'll just give you a little bit of a demo on that and then I'll show you some I already cleaned up. So let's, let's go back to the bench. So here we go. We've got now, can you see this well? Okay. Just come in like, I don't know, I want to get the light so you can see. Here's the flat surface, and here's our radius, or you could even call it that pillowed surface that we talk about. Are you picking that up? Yeah. So um, I would card scrape it lightly and then sand the radius. I just didn't know how the shadows were falling, if you can see the difference. So it makes a big difference just to throw that on there. It gives it a lot more style and refinement. And just the whole thing, it works better as the composition with the rounded top, as I'll show you in a second. So once I would round that up here, then I would soften the edges up in here. And then once I had all three, I would assemble my table, and I got three right here that I want to show you. So you can see these three have already been radiused, and up in here I had to do a little bit of uh, filing, a little, little wood file, and I used a spoke shave up here a little bit because I wanted to flatten it out. I didn't want the round over going into where the screw holes are going to be, and those were pre-drilled, obviously, to attach the top. All right, so let's throw this on here. The nice thing is they can go in anywhere. And get the last one in. Nice! So there we go. We have our contemporary looking table base. Nice. <laughs> what? <laughs> you look up from typing and you say, nice. <laughs> oh, no, I've seen it before. <laughs> oh, okay. My eyes are all over it. <laughs> it just sounded like, oh, that's nice. Larry's asking if you're going to join, going to join the post to the tabletop, the column to the tabletop. Oh, no. I, um, I'm thinking of making just a drilling a center hole and putting a small locator <laughs> dowel pin there that will locate in and then these screws these three screws will just secure it to the top it's very similar to the shaker style where it's just it's just four small screws that hold that top to the base the column is just um, tenon to that cleat but then the cleat is simply screwed to the top so 
That's the style. What do you think? Well, we've got to look at it and check it out under a table, I say. But I want to note one thing first is you've got this little flat right here. And when I look at that down on the floor, it's almost like you want to see a continuation. This is true of a lot of period pieces like uh, Queen Anne and I've, I've, on bases and Chippendale bases. Oftentimes you'll come in and you'll carve that. We leave that so in, for this one I think it should retain and have that curve come up. It almost has a gothic arch appearance to it and it's very streamlined. Star Trek to me. Yeah, <laughs> that delta shape. But um, so what I did was I, I made a little line on there. I'm not going to do it tonight, but um, you'd make a line and just kind of carry that line of the leg right up into the center like that. And then you want to take that out by, you know, you do that on all three, chop it in at an angle and you'll get something like that. So that one's not fully filed and fine, but you can see, you see that all right? I'm going to bring it up. Oh, that's still fun. When you look at the table, you're actually not that low. So that's why I'm saying if you okay. stand up. You want to bring it up. Okay. No, you're going to look down on it so that oh, that point gets silhouetted. If you go down too low, you see the mass ah, of the thing. So we want to create negative space there, and that's how we'll refine it. So instead of being just straight. Mm. That's, that's a big difference, you're right. <laughs> yeah, it does. It finishes it off. But that's, you can refine it and clean it up after it's glued up. Now, you, I'll talk more about the design of this if we ever make it. Like, there's some subtleties of, of joining this. But let's put one of the tops on and see how nice. it looks under how about under the mahogany? Oh, it's pretty. How does it work? So that's our more our contemporary yes, version. Yes, I can see a nice pizza on top of that. <laughs> it all comes back to pizza. It always does, Michael. <laughs> we ate a lot of pizza over Christmas. <laughs> Seemed like. All right, so. There's the difference. I mean, quite different, where you don't have that center column, but you have this weight and the mass comes up under the top. Um, now that base, my, my thought is to, for this table, to ebonize the base. It would be black. So then you have this black line with the sculptural shape of the base supporting the full radiance of color on the top. So um, nice. that's the thought there. And then. Merry Christmas, kids. Yeah. <laughs> now, I thought about it with different sizes. So I thought maybe that base would be better with a smaller top. So. Medium pizza? Yeah. <laughs> with a medium pizza, a 16 and 3 quarter inch. So almost an inch smaller. So I just cut out that as a model. And that looks actually pretty good on there. You know, it's funny, they often call these uh, m modern day, we don't call them candle stands, but um, you'll hear them referred to as occasional tables. You know, a side table or an occasional table. Usually occasionally. Some, I, we used to have these little, we had this little table once came into Pugs, and it was low, and I'm like, well, that's different, what's that? And Pugs said, that's a whiskey table. And I went, whiskey? I don't think I've ever seen one since. But they, it was even a little lower than this, and it was a smaller disc. So I guess if you had a small enough disc, this could be a whiskey table. <laughs> but um, <laughs> Getting questions about the if plans, the, Tom. Are if you the gonna... pandemic has driven you to that point <laughs> of needing a whiskey table. <laughs> Sorry, we're getting questions about full-size plans for this uh, table. Yeah, well, I'm glad to hear that because I have been mulling over should this be a project. I think it would be a sweet project. And um, yes, I would say those will be coming down the line. 
not right away. I still have some other things on my schedule, but we are thinking if this went well and you like it, this could be a course that we'll, we'll offer live in a similar format like this. So we would do the top. There's a lot of subtleties and nuances that we did not cover, but um, we will have full-size drawings available as well. Yeah, Will's asking whether or not you take the class. Options for attaching the legs besides the domino. Uh, well, I mentioned the biscuits. Yeah, you, know. you could do the biscuits. Um, I was actually thinking of a way to safely um, spline these. So if you think, I won't take that apart. I'll just take another one of my legs. If you took this to the table saw and you ripped just a little eighth inch groove right down there and stopped it on all three legs, you would then, rather than those, you'd have a spline and you'd also have to come up with a method to rip right down the center of your hexagon and then you could just have a simple spline in there that you would glue it in. And that would be super strong too. Especially if you can get the angle of the grain to be going across the spline rather than full length like that. So um, there'd be some strengthening across the joint that way. So that would be really simple. Um, like I said, with a, you could use the biscuit method um, with Norm Abrams type. You'd set it up exactly the same way as I did there to plunge and get some biscuits in there. That would be a super fast way. You could resort to the old um, um, dowel method with a dowel jig and just throw it in there. And then you'd have to come up with a way here. You could plunge route slots and put your own um, splines in there. Make your own, which I've done that too. There's a lot of ways, I mean, there's, that you could get around it. So in the course, I'll show, I'll probably show at least one other way that's cheaper and dirtier than the domino method, but, um, but pretty effective. I hope that answers that question. Yeah, we, we know those things are expensive. Yeah, you don't have the domino. I mean, I would say biscuit it before. The biscuit would be plenty good, because like I said, this is actually a pretty decent glue joint by itself. So the biscuit would help you glue it up without it sliding around, give you some alignment and some strength, and I would say plenty of strength. So the other option is to just clamp it on there and fire some, some nails. <laughs> you know, that's the way they would probably do it in a factory, right? Um, you just, mentioned, um, sorry, I'm interrupting you. You mentioned pillowing, the concept of pillowing. Is that what you said you would, had, were doing on those legs? Yeah, I mean, that's okay. one. You could refer to it that way as, like when you put a very soft radius on an ed, on a edge like that, or surface, um, I, I just I commonly refer, refer to it as pillowing. Because it's just subtle. There's not a full round over. You still have an edge on the corner, but it changes it up so much. I mean, I don't know how much you can pick it up here, but with that on the bottom there, it really gives a nice effect. And then with the zebra wood, let's see how that looks on there. See, this would be nice. I feel like this would be good in black or even a dark brownish to pick up some of the brown streaks in here. And I have a black, like blackish wingy edge band in there. So, but that, that looks pretty sweet there too. So I'm pretty happy with this that it's quite simple in some ways, but um, took, took longer than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> That's typical though, right? Par for the course. Yeah, and the, the fun thing I think about these kinds of projects and Tom, indicating his design processes that you can go wherever you want with it. That's the fun part. That's you know? right. So there's some ideas being put out here that 
Try it out. Yeah, you can choose Play a lot it. of different materials, little accents, um, change it up. But it makes a really sweet end table and a great gift. <laughs> I'm hoping. We'll see. We're going to ship those out. All right. Is that it for the questions? That is all with the questions. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I can see. Oh, I've got one here. Sorry. Uh, how do you find the right proportions on these tables? Ooh, well, one way is to reference a real jewel from the past. There's a lot of measured drawing books out there. So for this shaker candle stand, this table is almost the same dimensions. Um, it's got the same round top dimension and about the same height. This one being 24. I think that's a half inch higher. But um, so usually there's, they're pretty standardized heights for end tables um, or sofa tables. Those are usually right around 24. So um, that's why I chose 24 here. This would usually be next to a chair or off the arm of a sofa or something like that. Just go around your house sometime, just measure the heights. You'll, you're going to find it's right in that range. Maybe, uh, maybe 26, but usually they're closer to 24. Then your dining tables are 30. Um, so there's a lot of fairly standardized heights. And coffee tables are going to be more in the around 16 height, 16, 17 height for comfortable setting it forward, which is about the same height as your seat is. So it's usually close to being in plane of the actual seat you're on for a coffee table. So you start with that. You start with your overall parameters of the actual practical use height of the item, then decide the size. And then within that framework, you design whatever shape or style you want. So here I was going for a center pedestal, um, call it three leg base. And that's why I drew it that way. I drew the grid to scale right at my 24 and then the profile of one of these legs. And then we had it. Are you familiar with the Fibonacci rule? Am I saying it right? <laughs> Fibonacci? I'm, so, I'm sorry. Is that how you say it? Uh, it's F-I-B-O-N-A-C-C-I. -C -C yeah, I've heard about the Fibonacci, <laughs> Fibonacci series. Yeah, the Fibonacci rule. Do you use it? No, I... Um, Somebody remind me, I forget the sequence. Um, a lot of people ask about the golden mean, which is something like 1.4 or something ratio. Um, but I don't, no, I didn't use that on this. I went with, um, I wanted the outside edge to be, meet the diameter. So when this is on, if you drew, dropped a plumb line, you'd about hit here. Some of the small tables I've seen, they're actually out a little further. That's why I experimented with smaller tops to see if it looked better. Or more, gave a visual, more stableness visually if the leg was out further. But, you know, it didn't seem to matter that much. Um, you could go a little small if you wanted. So but, 1 to 1.614 ratio, <laughs> Michael says. Ken. Oh, are you, oh, you thinking of the golden mean? Golden... They call it the golden ratio? Yeah, the golden ratio. Yeah, okay, 1.6, yeah. yeah. This is so far from my normal conversation. No. Sorry. Uh, the diameter of the top, Bill's asking? Uh, this one's about, I think it's 17 and 5 eighths ish. Okay. Uh, but you can go a little smaller. Some of the candle stands I saw in some measured drawing books were um, 15 and a half. So that's why I was playing around with smaller. I thought, hey, maybe it would be better smaller. But this could go a little. But then you can't go too small because you don't want to see these cleats. That's why they're so relieved here. So you don't see them from above. So we've had a couple questions about in-shop classes and when we're going to post that schedule. I know you love that you love, I love that question. <laughs> I ask him that all the time, guys, so that's why. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, um, yeah, we, we've been more cautious this year, too, thinking about when things going to really open up and everything. I, 
we're going to have some this summer. So probably each month of the summer we'll have a one week or so. Keep posted for that. Sorry, I don't, I don't know right at the moment. Um, are there any classes that people are really jazzed for? I'm, I'm thinking. Uh, I know a number of people wanted to do the chair. We'll put um, some. We'll, we'll get on that yeah, conversation. Yeah, it'd be interesting to hear what some of the um, preferences if, are. If you used a solid wood top, would you? Let's see. Sorry. What would you would would you use it for the top if you wanted to use it outdoors? Kevin's Ooh. asking. Um, well, you got to use a, a moisture resistant or water resistant wood, and we talk about that a lot when we in the course like when we do the uh, Adirondack chair or the hanging swing outdoor swing. We've talked about um, that Adirondack I built out of cypress. You can use white oak. Um, good old mahogany, it's a little pricey, uh, locust, cedars, um, try to think what else. You know one thing I've used and maybe somebody can advise is how good is redwood outdoors? I think of it, I think it's a good outdoor wood as well. But uh, you'd want to use something like that for the top. Ken's asking if you used a solid wood top, would you need to worry about wood movement? Uh, yeah, a little bit, Cam. Uh, you got, uh, but look at the spacing of these holes there. Well, they're about like that far apart it would be the max, right? If you were going to be across the grain. So you could think about how you're going to orient. On this, um, you'd probably, the grain really isn't that much of a deal. I would just ream out these holes a little bit more. Because the movement you're going to get indoors over that amount of space is maybe a sixteenth of an inch, you know, seasonally. If it doesn't, if it's good and dry, it comes in, you'll be fine with a small top like this. You could always move the holes in a little more so you weren't grabbing it if you were concerned about that. But yeah, that's ah, a good that's question. Interest in a rocking chair. Excuse me, a child's rocking horse class. <laughs> child's rocking horse, wow. That'd be interesting, huh? Um, Heart Redwood is excellent outdoors, Dave says. So there you go. There's another one. It's hard to find, like, inexpensive um, outdoor woods that aren't too soft for a tabletop. So white oak is a pretty good outdoor wood, um, and that's good and hard. And it's not too pricey, but... Yeah. Can be. Rocking so. horse. That sounds sweet. Um, Tommy, have you ever used locust for any furniture? I haven't. I've only read about it, and that I've heard is good outdoor as well. And larch is also good outdoors. Tamarack, somebody said. Michael's saying. Awesome. Yeah, I haven't um, used either of those. Oval holes for a wood expansion, would that be helpful? Yeah, that's what I meant. Like, when you, if you just ream these holes out a little bit with the, with the drill so that the screw will actually kind of move a little bit and it'll give, because that thing's glued down. Okay. So if you do put a solid top on here, that's all I would do. I wouldn't worry about it too much. Okay, I think so. that's good. All right, everybody. Woo, it's good to be back in the design world and making new things. And we've got some great plans for the new year. So once again, it's great to have you to hang out in the shop. And if you enjoy this content, go ahead and subscribe and hit that bell Tell so you don't friends. miss a single issue. Tell your friends. Yeah, issue. <laughs> Episode. <laughs> I got issues for you. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time right back here on Shop Night Live. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much.